All right, so welcome to uh, your first online lecture on YouTube. Um, I am going to try to keep it a little bit like normal class. I'm going to do a, a This Day in the History and a fun fact today for you. Now, who knows, you might not be watching this on March 30th, but uh, the day I'm assigning that you need to have it watched by is March 30th, so I'm going to do this for March 30th. So This Day in History, March 30th, 1981. Ronald Reagan was shot, uh, attempted assassination attempt. The bullet did puncture his left lung. Uh, it did not, however, take away his sense of humor. Uh, as before he went into surgery, he told his wife, Nancy, honey, I forgot to duck. Uh, he also told his surgeons before they put him under for surgery, please tell me you're Republicans. So uh, amazing that he could remain so lighthearted uh, and have so much fun despite the terrible circumstances of what was going on. Uh, interestingly, uh, his assassin was a man named, his, assass, his attempted assassin, uh, this guy who tried to assassinate him, his name was John Hinckley. Uh, Hinckley's, uh, as far as I'm aware, in fact, I'm very positive of all assassin, assassins of presidents, uh, he's the only one not to be given the death penalty. And maybe it's like, well, because he didn't kill him. Well, that's not exactly why. He actually was never put in prison. He was put instead... Uh, into a mental institution, he was deemed actually to be actually insane. Uh, he was uh, found to have narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, he was a big fan of the movie Taxi Driver, so much so that he wanted to basically make his life like that movie. And in that movie, the main character, I haven't seen the movie, but I've, I've read the you know, about it. Uh, the main character basically... Uh, wants to assassinate the president, so he makes an attempt to do that. Uh, he also was fascinated with the actress Jodie Foster because she was in that movie, uh, so he was put in an institution. Uh, he was eventually released in 2016, so quite a bit after the assassination attempt, uh, and he now lives with his mother, but he still has to uh, have regular uh, scheduled visits with a psychiatrist to make sure everything's okay. Uh, also on this day in history, 1867, Seward's Folly took place. At least that's what it was called during its time. But this was when uh, Secretary of State William Seward purchased Alaska from Russia. Um, like I said, at the point at that point in time, people thought it was a big mistake. But nowadays, we know it probably was a really good move by the United States. And this day in history, 1855, violence erupted in Kansas during its first election. Now, this was before Kansas was a state. It was still a territory in the United States, but they were electing a legislature. But 5,000 border ruffians uh, invaded in from Missouri. These were pro-slavery people, uh, and they basically forced the election to end up in a pro-slavery -pro manner to make sure pro-slavery people were elected to the legislation. Uh, more votes were actually cast than voters. That lets you know there might have been a little bit of voter corruption involved in this particular election, plus violence was involved. Uh, let's go ahead and do some birthdays. March 30th, Vincent Van Gogh, very famous artist. Eric Clapton, famous guitar player and singer and songwriter. Robbie Coltrane, who is an actor. Uh, he played Hagrid uh, in the Harry Potter movies. Celine Dion, uh, I mean, my personal opinion, very gifted singer. I'm not saying I want to sit down and listen to her very often, but she does have an incredible range. Uh, but she's got a very unique sound, but... You either love her or hate her. I'm a little bit in between, but most people either really love her or really don't like her as far as her music goes. And Richard Sherman plays cornerback for the San Francisco 49ers. He played for the Seahawks before that. As far as our uh, fun fact today, according to the CIA's 2013 data, the United States has 13,513 airports that are recognizable from the air, which is more than the next 10 countries combined. So well, we've got a lot of airports and obviously a lot of airports that are big enough to be recognized from the air, so much so that more than the next 10 countries combined. That's pretty crazy. All right, so as far as right now, we're going to start with chapter eight. Uh, so if you have your book, that might be good. I did send you the slides for this, so you can be following along on that. I will be mentioning periodically throughout this video a few things you will need to answer in an assignment, but you got to stay tuned to know what those are. Okay, so opening the West, chapter 8. So we're going to start talking about you know, settlers, pioneers going out West, some of them coming obviously through Oklahoma as they make their way 
to places like California, Oregon, Texas, um, New Mexico, other areas as well. Okay, so let's take a look at the word immigrants. Obviously, this is not a new word to you guys. Um, one of the big issues in the United States today is what to do with immigration. Uh, how many immigrants do you allow in? Obviously, you have the other issue of illegal immigration, but we're not talking about illegal immigrants. We're just talking about immigrants. Uh, during this time period, uh, 1840s to 18, well, and from the 1840s on, really, the United States had a great influx of immigrants every year. Uh, an immigrant is obviously someone who moves from one country to settle in another country, and more and more people began coming to the United States, which was a fairly new, new nation at this point in time. And a big difference was people were coming because they thought the American style of government gave them a better chance to have a better life and a better chance to maybe achieve their dreams, um, something their governments were not doing primarily in Europe because most of the settlers coming, at least in these mid-1800s, would be settlers coming from Europe. Um, like I said, the mission of the United States, it seemed, was to expand dem democratic beliefs and ideas across the continent, and that would be known as Manifest Destiny. Uh, I, we've already alluded to this this year, so this is not a new concept. I've talked about Manifest Destiny before, but this is almost, people felt it was God-given, God-ordained, that the United States should spread across the entire North American continent from east to west, and that they should spread their ideals of democracy, uh, even somewhat of Christianity, and just the American way of life. They felt it was the best way, so they should expand that to more areas and include other people in that way of life. Now, the term Manifest Destiny uh, was first documented in 18, 1839, uh, being written in uh, by John L. O'Sullivan, who coined the term uh, based on something uh, that he read from an 1839 document in 1844. Uh, the, the people felt like they had this destiny uh, to uh, expand their ideas across the United States. Obviously, America was growing fast. Obviously, you had the original 13 colonies, which became the first 13 states. By the point in time we're getting to the 1830s, there are already quite a few more states besides those 13. America had expanded uh, you know, as far as even Missouri. Uh, becoming a state by this point in time about. So America also was growing, not just due to immigration, lots of immigrants coming in, but also a high birth rate. People were having very large families. So the population was just exploding and just booming. And a lot of those people wanted to go out west. It did offer them an opportunity to maybe own land, to maybe uh, create a successful farm uh, that they probably didn't have out east. Uh, this would be for immigrants and for American citizens alike opportunities could be had out west. Now, not everybody was going to seize those opportunities equally, but people went out west to try to do that. So settlers, traders, hunters were steadily pushing westward. Initially, when we purchased Louisiana territory, uh, Thomas Jefferson's thought was that would create a buffer between the United States and Indian tribes in the west, and that's part of the reason that they did the Indian removal too, was to get them west of the Mississippi and America could span to the Mississippi, but America is expanding so fast now that they're still co coming in conflict and that buffer zone no longer is really applying uh, by this point in time. Uh, you have a new president elected in 1844. He takes office in 1845. His name is James K. Polk. Uh, he was a pro-expansionist. I mean, he wanted to expand the territory of the United States. In fact, one of the first things he moves to do is to make Texas the 28th state in the United States. Uh, he also wanted to settle a dispute between the United States and Great Britain over where the northern border was for the Oregon Territory. Now, this is not the state of Oregon. Uh, Oregon Territory would kind of include the state of Oregon and Washington, but they settled on the 49th parallel uh, where that border would be, which is basically the southern border of Canada and the northern border of the United States. Uh, obviously, because America makes Texas into a state. This causes tensions to rise between Mexico and the United States. Uh, there was also some revolts and disputes going on in California as well, which at this point in time was also under Mexico's control. Um, America was trying to annex parts of California into the United States. 
The tension escalated until there was a war between Mexico and the United States, which lasted from 1846 to 1848. Uh, the war in California didn't actually last that long, but the war in Texas down then into Mexico did last uh, the majority of that wartime all the way to 1848 when the Treaty of Guadalupe was signed in 1848. The United States uh, gained, obviously, Texas. Uh, they gained other parts of the southwestern United States and California as well uh, as a part of the treaty to end the Mexican-American War. So Amer America comes out on top. Uh, this is also, side note, because this kind of relates to the next chapter, this is where a lot of generals who would become important, or military leaders who would become important in the Civil War gained their first experience in battle. Uh, a lot of them were friends. Uh, you know, Robert E. Lee fought alongside, uh, you know, people who were from the North during this war, and vice versa. Uh, they were all from the same army at this point in time, from the American army fighting against Mexico. So America has now gained more land and now has expanded from sea to shining sea. So what types of ways did people travel? Now this would primarily not be settlers, but for people who would maybe be explorers, people who would be taking a small number of people and not going with a large group, might go on a canoe or a keel boat. Here's a picture of a keel boat. I don't know how well you can see it uh, on your screen. Hopefully you can see it pretty well. Um, but it's obviously bigger than a canoe, can carry more people, carry more supplies. You'd have a canopy over here in case the rain to keep the supplies dry. Uh, oftentimes, especially if you're a pioneer and explorer, you would take Indian guides with you. This is the same type of boat that Lewis and Clark used uh, and would be used by, obviously, future explorers as well. But you could transport supplies in a keel boat. Eventually, you do get steamboats, but that's not for a little while because uh, obviously they would replace these types of boats over time. So many of the first trails used by uh, Americans going west and immigrants going west actually followed buffalo or animal paths or trails that Indians maybe had used for hundreds of years. Now a very significant event happens in 1848. I know it's 1849 that people think of as the California Gold Rush because that's when people really began going. But there was a discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in California in 1848, which caused many, and I mean many, uh, tens of thousands of people to travel west to try to strike it rich in California. Uh, some would go all the way around South America by boat uh, to get to California as well. So there was an influx of settlers coming to California. Some would even come from the east. This would be your first time that you'd get some Chinese settlers uh, and maybe a few other Asian groups, but mostly Chinese coming at this point in time. Uh, they weren't coming in large numbers, but there were some who were coming uh, here. However, the main trail being used by those going to California for this gold rush was the Santa Fe Trail. Um, this normally took about four to six months, and this would be from Missouri to California, a four to six month journey. Uh, you know, for parts of the journey, obviously it's pretty flat terrain uh, and, you know, you might have some trees and some hills, but you do eventually get to the Rocky Mountains where you're going to have to go through mountainous areas, uh, mesas and plateaus, and you're going to have to have a good route. So these trails, all these trails that we're going to be talking about would be an established route that people could go on so that they would know what to expect. So one thing I'm going to ask you guys to do, and you just kind of need to pay attention to things I'm going to say over the rest of this lecture, uh, like something you're going to have to answer this question. I'm going to want you to write a paragraph about what the journey west would be like, what an average day would be like for you. Let's say you traveled with your family. You're a teenager just like your age right now. Uh, of course, you don't have cell phones or anything like that. You gotta imagine you're living in 1848. You're heading along the Santa Fe Trail. You could be heading along the California Trail or uh, Oregon Trail. It doesn't matter which trail. But you're traveling on this trail. What would a day be like for you? Um, so you're gonna have to get a little bit creative here, but you're gonna use some information I'm gonna talk about. Uh, because the travel was pretty slow along these trails. You could travel on average about 10 to 20 miles a day, beginning depending on the weather. So an average day might be 15. 
a really good day, you got 20 miles in. A poor day, maybe it was raining, kind of muddy. If it's too bad, you might not be able to travel at all. But say you still could travel, you might only get 10 miles in. Now that may sound like a lot, uh, but when you're traveling from Missouri to California or Missouri to Oregon or wherever your destination is, that's really slow. Um, that means, you know, let's just say you started walking right now. You would, If you did good days, it would take you, you know, two and a half days to get to Tulsa. But if you had bad days because of weather with your wagon and all your stuff, it'd take you, you know, five, six days just to get to Tulsa. And that's not that far away. Okay, maybe five days, I guess, if it's bad travel. But that's not that far. Imagine it taking that long just to go that small amount of distance. Um, so, slow going. Uh, oftentimes, you would be walking. Uh, you might be able to ride in the wagon sometimes, but the wagon typically was loaded down with so many supplies. Uh, you might have one person riding, obviously, to drive the ox, which you preferred ox over horses or mules. Uh, maybe you have a horse or a mule, but typically the family didn't have enough horses or mules for everybody to ride them. So you probably would be walking that 10 to 20 miles. I guess you'd be staying in good shape. That's for sure. Uh, also, when you write in your paragraph, the type of food you would be eating. Uh, I mean, I'll admit I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and cover this here. Uh, but... You would probably be eating maybe some dried pork. It would be kind of like pork jerky somewhat. Uh, if you were drinking something, probably it would be coffee. Because uh, you at least would boil the water and get out the impurities. Uh, they would bring sugar along. You could put that in the coffee. There would be You would have some dried vegetables. They certainly would be fresh because they would go bad. Now, you might eat some fresh meat, but it would have to be something that you were able to hunt and get uh, while you were on the journey. Uh, you would be able to make bread, so you might have bread, uh, but that would be pretty much your diet every day. You, know, you wouldn't be getting a whole lot of different types of items. You're not going to get fresh fruits, or uh, you're certainly not going to get any Cheetos or uh, you know chocolate bars or anything like that. Uh, you don't have any of those luxurious items. A very basic diet is what you would have to have. Um, so you're walking long distances, in the weather, rain or shine, it might be a really hot day. Imagine you're walking 20, 10 to 20 miles on a day when it's 98 degrees in Oklahoma in the summer. You probably wouldn't get to 20 miles on that day because you'd be too exhausted, too tired. But you also might be walking on a day when it's 45 degrees and raining. Now, if the weather was really bad, you might stop and just say, we're going to spend a day here. If it's raining too hard, maybe it starts snowing. And you're like, it might be wise just to you know kind of wait it out. Um, but write a paragraph about a typical day on a journey along any one of these trails. Okay, so the Santa Fe Trail was used for the California Gold Rush. Uh, the Cimarron route was about 60 miles of the trail. It was, took, it was 10 days shorter than the route through the Rocky Mountains. Um, they both went through the Rocky Mountains somewhat, uh, but this one was a quicker way. And it, that route did eventually partly go through the Oklahoma Panhandle. Uh, the first person to use the Santa Fe Trail and the first wagon train to be pulled was in 1821. Um, thousands of people with their horses, mules, oxen, and wag wagons traveled across the Santa Fe Trail until eventually you got the coming of the railroad. But we'll get to that later on. Uh, deeply cut tracks made by wagons can actually still be seen in the Oklahoma Panhandle. So people also sometimes carve their names in some of the sandstone rocks out there. So there's still some evidence of the travels along the Santa Fe Trail through Oklahoma. Now the Texas Road, people leaving St. Louis and heading to uh, Texas would oftentimes go through Indian Territory uh, or even to Santa Fe would follow the Osage Trace, which is a part of the Texas Road. It passed by what is now Vanita and followed the Grand River. The Osage Trace came to be called the Texas Road. Road. So this is primarily not for people going to California, but maybe just going to Santa Fe or going mostly into Texas. We also have the California Road. Uh, this would be partly going through the mountains uh, and also making the way to California. I didn't really mention this, but we're going to cover chapter 8 like in this one video. Uh, in chapter 9, I'll have a video in a couple days. It will cover it. Uh, we're covering these chapters really fast. 
Um, so don't expect us to go real deep or detailed into a lot of these things. There were also other California trails, uh, which oftentimes came through Oklahoma Territory. If you want to see a map, uh, there is one in your book on page 201, which shows several of the trails that came through and where they went through in Oklahoma. So some of this I already alluded to on the traveling of the trails. Uh, your wagons uh, would need to be fairly simple, but you needed to have a covering that would be able to keep uh, rain and all the weather and the wind from, you know, destroying your food, destroying your uh, goods that you're taking with you. Uh, you'd have to have a sturdy built. So you probably would have an extra wheel or two because a wheel probably is going to break uh, on the way if you're traveling this far, especially. Like I said, you tended to want to use ox because they could travel longer uh, and they could withstand the drastic weather variations and the length of the journey better than horses and mules, especially if they're pulling the wagon. Uh, now, there were people who still used mules or horses. I'm not saying everybody used ox, but if you had a choice, you would use ox over that. And that, these were all things that were suggested in a book known as The Prairie Traveler, which was a handbook written by Captain Marcy. Uh, and he recommended what you should bring, what your uh, goods should be. Um, sometimes if you arrived at forts or places for supplies along these routes, they were running low on supplies because so many people were making these journeys. In 1850 alone, it was estimated that 70, 75,000 people went basically along the Oregon Trail and 25,000 along the southern routes. Um, so that's 100,000 people coming through the area, maybe not all of them came through Oklahoma, but coming near and around Oklahoma, 100,000 people traveling out west. Uh, obviously, you know, trade areas are gonna be running low on supplies because they don't have enough to keep up with that type of demand. Okay, and this will be our last slide. So this is a pretty short one. Um, eventually, you do get the development of the railroad. Obviously, it's pretty limited at first. The goal becomes to create the Transcontinental Railroad uh, to get it to go through all states. Also, during this time period, you have the development of two new territories. They're not states yet, but two new territories north of Oklahoma, Kansas Territory, and the Nebraska's Territory. I'm not going to talk about what this act did as far as the Civil War yet, because we'll talk about that next chapter, and we'll talk about it in a bunch next year in U.S. history. Um, but... Part of the Kansas-Nebraska Act does deem that the Transcontinental Railroad will go through these territories. That's part of why they passed this act. They had no right to make uh, the railroads through these areas if, if they weren't a territory of the United States. So they created these territories partly, partly, not, old, not the only reason, but partly so they could uh, have the railroad run through these areas. And eventually you would have the Transcontinental run, Railroad running through these Kansas-Nebraska territories. Um, we'll cover this a little bit later too, but it was May 10th, 1869 that the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. They began building tracks, obviously all the way from San Francisco to the East Coast. They are able to connect those tracks in Promontory Summit, Utah uh, on May 10th, 1869 and complete that. Uh, and the railroad is huge. It speeds up um, transportation a great deal. And those wagon things we just talked about, people still might use that, but the railroad is going to negate a lot of those slow travels. Uh, so that's going to be one of the major changes, not just in Oklahoma history, but in world history. A railroad really advanced uh, things a great deal through travel. Um, as far as the rest of this chapter, I'm not even actually going to talk about the Butterfield Overland Mail. You can look into that if you would like. Um, so as far as assignments, from this video, you need to answer the question, the paragraph about what a journey would be like uh, if you were traveling out west, an average day in that journey. Um, I also want you to answer uh, in your book, I want you to look at the chapter review, building skills using mileage charts. Uh, I want you to do that on page 209. Uh, that will, these will be due um, by Tuesday. Okay, so Tuesday the 31st. I will be sending out an email with some information about other things because I am going to link another video besides this one, which is extra credit. It's a funny video, uh, 
made by Studio C, but it's about life traveling on the Oregon Trail. Uh, but I will put questions to that in an email. Like I said, that one's extra credit. You don't have to watch it. Uh, but it's only a few minutes. You may as well. Plus, it's pretty funny. So just signing off. Hoping you guys are doing well. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Uh, hopefully, we can get back in the classroom sometime soon. Uh, but regardless, uh, let's keep learning about Oklahoma history.